the IGBA and the presentation today is a um, is entitled let's see if this works it did oops or it didn't and now it did again the art of negotiation or it's all about the deal or is it um, I've been involved with uh, negotiations for a long time. I guess we all have, more or less. Um, as I said, uh, my name is Tom Pascali, the game attorney. I work exclusively in the video game industry, representing independent developers. Um, little background, I guess. Uh, I was a kind of a late bloomer. Dropped out of college. Was in a rock and roll band for several years. Went back to college. Uh, ran a couple businesses in the interim period um, and ended up in law school uh, and uh, I got into law school in my mid-thirties uh, did a couple I think unlike most law school uh, people I did uh, actually took two different courses in negotiation in school um, thinking I was going to go into business and then ended up going into uh, litigation for the first uh, 10 or 15 years of my career but in litigation, uh, you know, that's lawsuits. Uh, uh, in most cases, the courts require you to go to a, to a mediated uh, uh, negotiation to try to resolve a case without having a trial. And in the course of that, I've uh, probably done a lot of mediations, maybe somewhere around 40 or so, uh, which are negotiated uh, meetings where they bring both parties into into a a, a sim, sing, single location, they get to talk to each other, and then they split up, and the uh, mediator goes back and forth with uh, with offers and uh, proposals until there's a, a settlement. I actually settled five cases in one week uh, with a mediation every day. Um, longest mediation I had, I, just, I think, it was about a day, well, about 14 hours. Um, in, uh, in the mid 90s, I fell in love with video games and eventually slowly, uh, uh, probably as a result of Quake, moved, moved my practice into, into video games. Uh, and uh, mostly just because I love games and if I wasn't involved in, in helping developers I probably would have dropped out of the, of the uh, game industry a long time ago. And about I don't know, 10, 11 years ago I grabbed the game attorney uh, domain name and I've been the game attorney ever since then, and I help my clients uh, with negotiating deals all the time. Um, is some of the more experienced people just have me do the paperwork at the end. Uh, some of the people that I sort of am more as much a counselor as I am uh, their lawyer, um, I can be involved uh, at the very beginning of negotiations or even at the exploratory phase uh, assisting in business development. So I sort of see all aspects of this. I think about it probably more than more than I should and less than I could. Uh, so uh, let's get on with it. So I guess the first thing is, is a developer is, uh, is you, you well, well, why bother to negotiate? Uh, isn't it okay to just, you know, can I just, uh, can I just, I, I mean, I really just want to make my games. Uh, and what I tell people like that is uh, if what you want to do is make your games, go get a job making games. Um, but if you want to own a studio so that you can make the games that you want to make, which is a challenge and probably a fool's errand, but the reality is if you're going to do that, if you're going to go that route, then you need to be, you know, need to agree to be a business person. And if you're not going to agree to be a business person, then you need to find someone who's going to be the business person for your company. Uh, because, you know, just like any other commercial venture, uh, it's a business, and as a business, you have to take take that part seriously. Um, I think it's important to take the same sort of care that developers do with their code and their art and their game design, uh, and getting the right people to do the right jobs, um, as it is to do your negotiations and contracts. Uh, and I know it's kind of difficult for people who are in the creative uh, uh, industries to acknowledge that, but the reality is if you want to succeed, you really have to take care of business just like you have to take care of all the other aspects of your, of your, uh, of your work. 
and running a successful studio, of course, means doing your best to get the best deal in every deal, uh, if at all possible. So that's where negotiation comes in. So what's negotiation, right? I mean, what's the deal with this? It's really not a mystery. I think anybody, uh, anybody who's ever been a child of a parent or a parent of a child or in any sort of relationship uh, negotiates all the time. You negotiate, you know, with your family. You know, the these parent kid relationships are full of negotiations. You want to stay out late. You want your kids to come in early. Whichever it is, there's a negotiation for sure. There's a bargain. There's a meeting of the minds, or not. And if there's no meeting of the minds, then there's a breach of contract. Um, also, on your development team, you know, the, your design meetings are all negotiations. Uh, in the marketplace, uh, if you ever bought a car, I mean, yeah, that's kind of the worst thing you have. But a four-way stop, you know, you pull up to a four-way stop. Here in the Pacific Northwest, it's the all always the oh no you go oh no you go and everybody sits at the four way stop for like a half an hour waiting for the other person to go. But these are all negotiations, that's for sure. So it's not something you're completely unfamiliar with. Um, but you probably or you may not have put in as much detailed thought into this as people who negotiate more. Um, and you might say, well, yeah, negotiate, yeah, negotiation with my family is one thing. But uh, contracts are different. Well, they certainly are. Uh, although the dynamics are, are the same, and some of the issues that you have around them, the things that are probably a little different would include, for example, uh, issues like uh, you know, obviously the goal of it is obviously different. Uh, the uh, the relative bargaining power of the parties can be significantly different. Although I don't know, when I bargain with my wife, I probably a lot like a small studio dealing with a big publisher, uh, no leverage. Um, obviously, multiple points of pain, which may be different than, than the simple basic type of negotiation you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but the the, uh, the overall dynamic is similar, and I and I and I say this mostly just so that um, so that you will understand that this is not something necessarily uh, to be afraid of. So in a commercial negotiation for a, a development studio, or in, in our industry pretty much anywhere, what's, what's the difference? Well, I, I think it, certainly there's cultural differences um, between the parties, which is, a, which is kind of unique. Um, I did a presentation at GDC years ago where it was entitled, this was before the advent of uh, self-publishing, uh, and it was all about you know, uh, the publisher's rules of acquisition and uh, this had come about because one of my clients, we were, we were trying to negotiate something, and, and he just couldn't understand why the publisher wasn't just trying to be fair with him. Uh, and, and didn't they just really want to make the best, get the best game that could possibly be made out into the marketplace? And I, I was struggling trying to uh, describe to him who was, he was, he was the art lead for the company and really an absolute genius artistically, um, but at the same time, not too good at uh, nuts and bolts stuff. Um, certainly didn't have a clear understanding of business. And so basically, I, I, I just blurted out, no, you have to understand, they're Ferengi. And uh, as soon as I used that reference, he got it. I said, so look, look at, uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with Ferengi, Google it. Um, the Ferengi is a culture that's based on... Uh, on the rules of acquisition, the first rule of acquisition is profit is good. And all the other rules of acquisition are derived from that. And this, has, this sounds kind of goofy, but at the same time, if you think about it, um, corporate players do have the primary good as being profit, which means ultimately they don't care about your game. Um, and this is pretty much true of everybody in, in, who deals, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not painting everybody with the same brush here, but people who do business development, people who run companies are basically, you know, about the, about the economic best interests of their company. Uh, sure, we all make friends in the industry. When it comes down to deals, a deal's a deal, business is business. So that's something. Uh, one of the other things that I think is, is kind of 
unique and important to take into consideration is the familiarity that most of the people that developers deal with have with the contracting process in general and specifically in negotiating contracts. Um, developers uh, including license agreements for middleware and licenses and all the other things you could possibly do um, except for maybe uh, you know employee and contractor agreements if they do five five to ten contracts in a year that's probably a lot and most of them are not significantly negotiable or you're not going to negotiate a, a, a an engine license terms uh, except for possibly if you have a lot of leverage uh, you're probably not going to be able to negotiate even some of your some of, some of your distribution contracts so, you know Sony has 20 they geez they used to have you know about 200 300 pages of contracts uh, they, they've been trimming that down they've got some sort of universal contract now but none of those terms are going to be negotiable and that's just the way it is Fortunately, they don't enforce those even more onerous terms. But the simple fact is that you know, uh, you're doing 10 contracts a year, and they're doing 10 a week, or maybe 10 a month. So they're very, very familiar with the um, with the process. They're also loaded with biases. Um, it's really it's not at all uncommon for um, people on the, that you're doing business with to actually. Uh, blanch when they see you making changes to their agreement, uh, and that's because you know, you know why are you being difficult? You know, things like that. And I think a lot of developers worry about hurting the other side's feelings, or they're going to think I'm hard to deal with if I'm trying to negotiate uh, aggressively. Uh, and, and that's just simply not true. They just think you're being a business person, and and they actually kind of respect it. I think people who um, who don't fight for their for the best deal. Are often looked at as chumps or, or, uh, or juniors, and I'll explain that term in a minute. The other things that you have to look at is uh, okay. So, what is so? How how do I take advantage of, of their familiarity with the process? Well, they have they certainly have blind spots. Um, they have some things that are really really important to them, and other things that they're not. And they may be uh, somewhat uh, uh, lackadaisical about the process. You know, a bit. That wrote. Oh, this is what happens next. So by uh, manipulating the process a little bit, you can you can you can often uh, get a, get some sort of, uh, uh, of tactical advantage in in, in the process. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important is these people deal with people all the time. They negotiate with people all the time. The first impression that you give to someone in a relationship, and all of these deals are about a relationship. Um, is probably going to stick, and if they think that you're green, uh, they will junior you uh, to death. Uh, oh, this term doesn't make any sense to me. Well, that's just the way it's done in the industry. You know, if anybody ever tells you this is the way it's done in the industry, uh, a red flag should go up immediately. Oh, this guy can't even justify it, so he's falling back on that old old horse. Uh, it's uh, it's one it's a it's when I hear it, my little alarm goes off. So uh, I think a lot for a lot of developers is you know we just want to make our game. Let's get this deal over with. I mean the really hard part is getting a contract, right? Uh, maybe so. Maybe we should just sign it. I mean we don't want to rock the boat. Um, this is just this is so wrong. Um, the hard part isn't getting isn't getting the contract. I know I've seen people sign incredibly bad deals because as as developers often do. You know they're kind of head down in the project, making the game, making the game, making the game. They don't know whether it's good or whether it sucks. You know they they really don't get much positive reinforcement. Yeah, their mom says, "Oh, I like what you're doing" or whatever, but they're not getting that kind of real solid reinforcement that they want to get as as a as someone who's in, involved in a creative process in isolation. So they show it to somebody, and that person says, "Wow, that's really good. We'd love to distribute that for you. We want to publish your game." And they're sort of overwhelmed with the positive reinforcement that that's all they're thinking about. Um, I had a client had this, uh, it was a tactical war game, very niche sort of thing. And, uh, and they were at GDC or some other conference and they showed it to a publisher, a publisher that actually was fairly active in this niche market. 
and the guy looked at it and said, "Hey, hey, we'd love to publish it for you. You know, we, we're not going, we can't fund it, but we'll, you know, we'll publish it when it's done. Uh, you can sign a publishing agreement right now." So, without thinking through what was happening, where he was in the process, and I think in part because he was so enamored of the positive feedback, he went ahead and signed this agreement. Um, a year and a half later. He's, he, he was just sort of out of gas. He was out of resources. He was out of money. Uh, he really was not there, not at the finish line on the game. It wasn't ready to be, be distributed. Um, and he ran into, he, he started talking to another publisher. The publisher said, look, it, we, we'll publish your game. We'll give you a $100,000 advance so that you can finish the game and make it as good as you want it to be, and then we'll publish it for you. Well, of course, he may have been taking a hit on the percentage in the back end, but at least he was going to get enough money to finish his game. So he went back to the original publisher. Now, keep in mind that they had done absolutely nothing. They had signed his contract. They hadn't advanced any money. They hadn't done any advanced promotion. They hadn't even talked to him for over a year. And he said, look, I have this publisher who is willing to fund the completion of my game, so I need to get out of my contract. And they said, quite simply, Sure, we'll let you out of your contract for $25,000. So basically, he had to pay $25,000 for signing that contract a year and a half earlier, and nothing else. Now, the reality is the contract probably wasn't enforceable, but it would have cost more than twenty-five dollars to do it, to, to prove that in court. So, um, so what, where, was, where did he go wrong? Well, he was signing a distribution deal for a game that wasn't ready to go to market. You don't need to distribute a game a year and a half before it goes to market. And you sure as hell don't need a publishing agreement a year and a half before your game's done unless they're giving you something in the intro. So what he should have said is that's great when my game's ready to go to market, I'll come I'll be I'll be sure to let you guys know and we can do the publishing deal. And pretty much an inexperienced rookie move. Uh, can't fault him for it. I mean, you know, everybody gets bad deals, especially early on. But it's a lesson to be learned, and certainly one that I pass on every, at every opportunity. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the negotiation itself. The first thing to keep in mind is it's, it is a process, not an event. Um, I almost made that the title of this talk. Uh, but it really is. And, uh, and uh, as we go through this, fleshing this out, um, I think the conclusion is going to be that it's a process that, that, that actually goes on not just until there's a signed agreement but way after that. That's a later slide. Um, and, but, but really what happens here is the execution of the contract, the written agreement, is the beginning and it's not the end. It's the beginning of, 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 the, of the relationship. Uh, so I think that looking at the, uh, at the contract, um, like that and, and the negotiation up to the execution of the contract and the continued performance under the agreement uh, is, is, is really, it is a process. Um, the other thing I think that's important for people to understand is um, this, um, this is, it's not combat. It's, co it's a cooperative venture. It's a business deal. It's not a war. Now that doesn't mean that you don't vigorously advocate your position, but you don't want to hate the other side because at the end of the deal, you don't want to belittle them. You don't want to think of them as bad people or any of that stuff because at the end of the deal, um, if it's successful, what you want to come out of this with is a really strong relationship with these people based on uh, a desire to work together and mutual respect. And so, you know, Adopting the correct tone through the process is really important. And, and to get there, I think one of the things you need to do is you need to prepare for the negotiation. So before you, even before you begin the negotiation in earnest, what, what are the sorts of things you should, you should be thinking about? Well, first of all, hold on. I should have thought of this. First of all, you need to realize that every contact you have with the other party forms a basis for the negotiation. So this is this goes to the first meeting, uh, the elevator pitch that you give them, uh, that that the, play, the 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 reception of the bar where you had a couple beers, 
um, that lunch, say, I'm really interested in what you're doing, maybe we could grab a lunch or dinner. Um, that's, it's all a negotiation. I mean, it's all part of the negotiation. It's all establishing uh, each other's perception of who you are and what you are. Uh, but when it comes to the point where things are getting serious, um, then you really need to analyze um, as best you can based on the available information what's really, uh, what the real issues in the negotiation is. And I, I, I've seen this with a lot of guys who do a lot of contracts. Is, uh, specifically, I did a presentation with a, with a, a publisher's rep uh, Lee Jacobson and uh, and Barry Friedman, who who was uh, one of the first big uh, uh, game developer agents uh, back in the day, and they were talking about negotiation. We did a presentation at GDC on negotiation. One of the things that they both said is, when they go into a negotiation, they know exactly what 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 parts of the contract are negotiable and which ones aren't, based on their years of experience. Well, that's kind of true. That's a pre preliminary bias that I was talking about, but it, it's it's probably not absolutely true. A lot of times, people may have flexibility on issues that just haven't been pushed on. So anyway, what you what you really need to do as you as you're preparing to to go into a, a, the more formal part of the negotiation, this would be the part before you get to the contracting part. Um, you you should be thinking about things like okay, <clears throat> what's our relative bargaining? Uh, positions here. Uh, what, what, uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of leverage do they have? What kind of leverage do I have? And sometimes it's real simple. You have a game. Uh, they have money, but keep in mind that uh, publishers sell games for a living. So without games, they really don't have anything. All they have is money, which doesn't make money. Well, it makes money, but it makes it at a very small percentage. Whereas games can make money at a much larger percentage. And they are Ferengi, and profit is the primary good. Um, so relative bargaining positions, uh, there's, a, there's a concept called the point of pain. Um, there are points of pain uh, for publishers in these deals um, that you might not think of. For example, a uh, client I had one time had a, a racing game, you know, it was a, I think it was a dirt bike game, something like that. And uh, I, as I recall, it was on uh, the Nintendo platform, whichever the flavor of the year was. And they were just, this is a, it was sort of, it was actually, they'd been a work for Hire House. This was an original IP that they'd just been sort of playing with. And it, it had gotten to the point where it was, it, was, it was pretty much ripe. They could have finished it and, and, you know, it was ready to go out. They didn't have a deal. And all of a sudden, they're talking to a publisher that's going into E3 and doesn't have a racing game in their portfolio. And it was real important to this publisher to have, you know, every single slot that the buyers who were coming into E3 to, to, look at the, to look at all these games, they needed to have a product in every slot. This publisher had never done a deal where the, where the developer re, uh, development studio retained the intellectual property rights, but they did one this time because they needed it, and they needed it now. Uh, so there's a point of pain that's completely unrelated to the negotiation that we learned of in the discussions that really, um, really had a huge impact on it. Uh, Another thing is that, that to, to watch for is the internal dynamics of the other party. And this is the company as well as um, the individual. That last case was sort of a case where the company was in a certain dynamic that they needed to, they, they had something they needed. <coughs> I was talking to a, to a, to a, a friend of mine and he was, he'd been in a situation where he was trying to get a license for a game. And he went to, he went to the studio that held the licenses and what had happened is, there was a new person, a brand new person, was in the licensing, was in, in charge of licensing, and she really wanted to sign some deals right away to show her superiors how really good she was at licensing stuff, and, uh, and that she could basically deliver, because obviously there's two things. There's one thing of getting the most out of a license, and the other thing is being able to license a lot of IPs especially when you go to a company that has a huge, you know, if they've got a person who's responsible for licensing, part of their business model is licensing those IPs. So her thought was if she licensed them for a little less but got more licensing deals in, it would show that she was being productive. She needed something to report out on. Huge dynamic, uh, great leverage, uh, guy got a huge deal. Um, so uh, the other thing is, uh, what the best thing that I found, one of the things to consider when you're when you're talking to your your friend on the other side of this deal, 
is do whatever you can to make them your advocate internally. Um, it's quite often that in a negotiation, the person you're dealing with, the biz dev person, is not the final decision maker. You may want things out of this deal that they don't, that they can't agree to, but that they, but if you convince them uh, that they really want the project and that they really want to work with your studio, um, maybe they can sell those 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 needs internally. And of course, uh, the other thing you need to be aware of or try to try to understand and suss out is the whatever deal breakers are on both sides, but yours as well as theirs, um, because that's part of what makes uh, what allows you to get to a final resolution. And uh, I think the other thing is you need to remember is sometimes it's 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 all about no. If you can't say no, you can't negotiate. You have nothing. And you need to have uh, this. Ooh. Batna or B A T N A, sort of like. IGDA or IGDA. Um, BANA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Uh, this, it, which is, you know, it's a little wordy, but it was developed by uh, Roger Fisher and, and Bill Early at the Harvard Program on Negotiation. Yes, Harvard has a program on negotiation, and these guys study negotiations for, for a living. Um, this is actually uh, seems derivative of uh, uh, a game theory concept of a disagreement port point, uh, or what's referred to as the Nash equilibrium. Um, um, and if you want another, I, I don't usually reference people because I make stuff up, but actually this is uh, this is by Nobel laureate John John Forbes Nash, and it's referred to as a Nash in, in academia referred to as a Nash equilibrium. And that's a point where there's a group of players. This is out of game theory, with the choice of strategies. And the Nash equilibrium point is where there is a point where everybody can get a resolution if they stick, if they stop changing strategies and just proceed. Um, when I was negotiating uh, with with mediators, it was always it, 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 sort of the rule of thumb was um, it's a successful uh, mediation if everyone walks away, but nobody's really happy. You know, which everybody has sort of felt that they've given as much as they can, um, and uh, and that uh, that but they got what they they got what they needed to resolve this. So uh, I think it's important to have a best alternative to a negotiated agreement before you go into any negotiation seriously. And if you can't walk away, then you're going to get beat up. I mean, you can you can bluff your way through it and get the best deal you can, and you should. But it's it's not the same as just being able to say no. The best negotiations I've ever had were when I was representing uh, some of the best ones. I was representing uh, uh, John Romero and Brenda Romero and, and some deals when they first put Loot Drop together, and they had huge success with a with a Facebook game. And this is when Facebook games were all that. And we were negotiating with three or four different companies simultaneously, and. Uh, all the companies really, really wanted to work. And we're talking big guys, you know, the, the, the three or four biggest uh, Facebook publishers there were at the time. And they all wanted to work with John and Brenda. And uh, man, it was a, it was a treat because uh, we could we were pushing them around and saying no over and over again, and it worked. So another tactic I think that's really important. So you've got all this stuff together. Now we're gonna we're gonna think about. Uh, uh, getting into the process, and, and the, the first thing that I want to want to caution you is that patience, perseverance, persistence are all things that will allow you will will allow you uh, to prevail and get the best possible deal. So um, don't panic. Patience. Um, traditionally, the people with the money go real slow because they don't have deadlines and often especially if there's money involved the, the development studio is starved for cash and needs a deal right away uh, this is a recipe for disaster um, take your time 
just like I said earlier, you want to take the same care in the negotiation that you do with building your game. If it takes five years, to, if, it took two, if it took two years to build your game, don't try to negotiate a deal in two weeks. You know, give it some time because you're going to need it or you're going to, or you're going to not get what you need out of it. Uh, persistence. Um, I can't tell you how many times that uh, I've, I've, uh, I get a contract from the other side, right? And, I, and I, this is when we're at the contracting phase. And um, it's, it is their dream deal, right? Um, and now we're sort of, uh, we're sort of deep, in, deep into it now, right? Um, and the, uh, it's, their dream, it's a dream contract. You know? It's not even the contract we negotiated. Um, and this is actually not uncommon. You know, you, you, you negotiate you negotiate with a biz dev person and you agree to all this stuff, and then you get the written agreement from them, and it's completely different, right? Um, well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, the biz dev guy negotiated the deal with you and then sent it over to legal, and they sent you the standard contract, which is their dream contract because usually the person who writes the contract writes it substantially in their own favor. So you get this, and I've seen this so many times where my client is screaming, this is bullshit, this isn't the deal we, this is not the deal we made. Well, of course it isn't. It's the deal they sent. So, um, you know, when, I, when it's in my hands, what I'll do is I will then send back, it, it, depending on how extremely biased and one-sided their agreement is, will very much affect how biased and extreme uh, the revised version that goes back to them. And uh, when you start negotiating terms like this, it's, it's important to um, put in a few bargaining chips. You know? Think about that dynamic of things that they really want but that are a little unusual and then take them out. And make them fight to get what you don't care about and then maybe you'll be able to trade it for something that's really important to you later in the negotiation. Um, also, you can use this to create positive momentum when you're getting into the tough spots, uh, and that is, you know, you throw a couple of these chips on the table. Uh, you know, you, you said this is important to you, you, you act like it's important, and then you acquiesce on it in exchange for them acquiescing on something else, or you just give it back. Um, it's, uh, it's also real common uh, for uh, one party to take a provision or take a provision out or put a provision in the negotiation and then the other, other party you know refuse to accept it uh, there's nothing wrong with putting it back again later I mean you don't want to you want to put it back in the next round but uh, I've, I've done that on several occasions and, 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 and the interesting thing is uh, on the other side of these deals the people who do these deals all the time it's very common for them to just keep beating on a point and even if you say this is a deal breaker if you if you need to have this in the contract we can't go forward and they will still continue to harp on it and put it back and put it back and put it back um, a telephone negotiation this company wanted to write a first refusal on all the future games from the studio it was a no it was a no it was a, it was a non-starter wouldn't agree to it told them we wouldn't agree to it in the written written back and forth we set up this huge conference call, five people on their side, three people on our side, we went back and forth on all of the pen, all of the outstanding issues. By the way, this is a great way to get the final, you know, final deal done. Um, we get to this point, we say no. They say, they again say we need to have this uh, in a lot of words because these are lawyers so they get to use a lot of words. Um, we say no, they say blah, 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 blah. Again, they want it. It's real important to them. It's essential to the deal, blah, blah, blah. We say no. You know, this goes on. I swear to God, they 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 pushed this point five consecutive times in about a, and, and spent 15 minutes on this one point. And I finally said, "Look, at guys, we've said no to this five times so far. We've explained that this is a non-starter for us. We will not sign a contract with those provisions in there. Is there anything about no that you're not understanding?" And I think I may have said, "Is there something about the word no that you don't understand?" But I think at that point, because I stopped the whole process and sort of, you know, called them on their bullshit, um, that's that we got through it. Um, another another tendency I see a lot of times with, with developers um, is they will say, "We'll be talking about um, a deal." So this would be an internal discussion that you're having, 
either with members of your team or, or with your outside counsel or whatever. And uh, and 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 an issue would come up and say, well, oh, they're not gonna they're not gonna agree to that. Well, that's called negotiating for the other party. And if you want to negotiate for them, go ask for a job. But don't do that in your own in your own meetings. Don't do that on your own side. You don't want to negotiate their position for them. They know what their position is. They're big boys. They can handle it themselves. So you want to negotiate your position, and you want to ask for things that you don't think you're going to get, because if you don't ask, you won't get them for sure. And if you foreclose yourself from issues that you could possibly get without asking, then you're just doing your, 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 your studio a huge disservice. Let's see. Um, don't let them see you sweat. Don't act anxious, and I got another. I'm looking at my notes here, and I like this one. Uh, no means no from you, and maybe from them. So if they say no to a provision, come back to it over and over again. You know, don't drop it. If you drop it and come back to it, then it's kind of, you know, sleazy. Um, also, when you get, if you're doing it in written agreements and you're tracking changes, always accept all the changes and compare it to an accepted version of the prior draft to make sure that they're not. Uh, not putting terms in there that you have that you're not aware of. It's anyway, so you finally get the deal. Wasn't this great? It's over. Uh, no, it isn't. It's a lie. Here's the deal. Contracts are organic. I mentioned this earlier, but I think this is important because I think a lot of uh, a lot of people that I deal with, just especially people who haven't been doing a lot of negotiations, uh, just don't quite get. It. And that is um, the written contract is the starting point of the working relationship between the parties. Yes, it establishes the terms of the ongoing relationship, but in a best case scenario, it can also be an, it also sets the parameters for an ongoing negotiation. All contracts are subject to negotiation and usually should be. Um, there are two types of things, I guess. One is uh, the shit happens thing, where they have to provide you with certain assets to, to do something, and they're late, and now you're late, and it's, no, it's just nobody's fault, or it's somebody's fault, but you guys agree to a modification of the delivery schedule, okay? Um, that's a negotiation, right? But one thing is for sure. All of these contracts are going to have an incorporation clause that says, if it's not in writing, it doesn't count. So if you change your delivery schedule without signing off on it, most of them say it can only be modified in writing. And if that's the case, then every time there's a material change in anything in, in terms of timing or deliverables, then you need to put that in writing. And a perfect example is you're doing a work for hire deal and you're halfway through the thing and and um, some of what was supposed to be in milestone four is pushed off to milestone five, and now you know now you're sort of. But they agree to give you the money anyway, but they're not waiving the claim of breach. You need to push to get that up, signed off on in writing, because technically, uh, under most of these agreements, if you're in breach, regardless of whether they pay you or not, you're still in breach, and the terms. What happens to you in terms of uh, if you're terminated for cause versus if you're terminated without cause is usually substantial. And if you have a breach, regardless of whether you're paid or not, unless the contract says paying you is a waiver of, of any claim of breach, um, you're no longer, your deliverables are no longer consistent with the terms of the agreement and you're in trouble. So that's a situation where shit happens, you need to, you need to do an addendum to the contract acknowledging that the change in terms that the schedule has been, you know, you're running late. The schedule should be modified, not just for that deliverable, but for every subsequent deliverable. Or you're going to be late every time, right? And you're going to be constantly in breach, which puts you at a constant disadvantage in the relationship in terms of business. So that's the first situation where there should be, where there's an ongoing negotiation that reflects the current state of affairs. The other one is if there are delay, if if there's modifica modifications to the design document. It's real common for developers who want to please to end up doing all sorts of shit that's not in the contract, making changes, expanding the design document, adding, geez, I, when early on I had one client who agreed, who had a contract for a multiplayer game and they ended up delivering 21 levels of single player and, and went bankrupt in the process. 
um, because they went back to the developer and to the publisher and said, "Hey, we would really like to do this bigger game," and the publisher said, "Sure." And what they should have done is negotiated, right, and said, "We could really deliver this much better, bigger game if you will pay us the additional six months of development time that it'll take us to get it done." Um, it's called an upsell. You get it all the time. Would you like the sports package with that nice convertible you just bought? You know, uh, it's, it's really typical, but I think it's something that uh, developers often don't focus on. So, and that can actually turn a nominally valuable contract into a very valuable contract as long as you remember to factor in profit in every single thing. So, um, so I guess in summary, what I guess I'd say is, you know, be strong, stay focused and engaged. Be patient, be persistent, and make sure that every deal you do is the best deal you can get. And that's it. So, um, if you guys are nice, I'm going to open the mics For questions, because I think we've got a fairly small group, and I'm pretty sure we'll be okay with it. Yeah. Okay. If anybody has a question, say so. Anyone? Hey, Tom. Chris here. Yeah. Um, how? One of the concerns I have when I go in is knowing or or, or feeling like I know what is reasonable. To ask for, right? Like, I don't want to be. I I understand the business concerns of the people that I'm setting up contracts with, right? And of course, all their cards are held close to their chest. So, how do I know what you know, what what is a good? You know, I don't I, like. I'm not trying to cheat anybody. I'm just trying to get the best deal, as you say, um, and without. You know, leaving a bunch of money on the table, also. So, I, how, how would I know what's reasonable to ask for? Well, I don't understand the question. Why would you care what's reasonable? Do you think because they, they care what's reasonable? I'm, I'm messing with you a little bit, but I think it's no, a serious no, I, question. <laughs> and that is, you know, is it? I mean, what's so bad about being a little unreasonable, Chris? Well. I'm concerned it makes me look like I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, I don't so, know. Right. So you, I, I mean, I'm I'm an expert in what I do. I am not an expert in contract negotiations. Um, and so I don't like if I come in and say, yeah, I want a million dollars, and they're thinking to themselves, well, our entire budget is half that, right? Like they're just gonna sort of say, well, thanks a lot. See you later. You know, like no, if, if you have say, Chris, they're probably going to say, well, I'm, "Gee, Chris, our, our our budget's only half that, and we have other things we need to take care of." Yeah, you need to you need to have a a reasonable um, expectation. But I I I think you know worrying about being fair with them is what I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you can you can try to come to. I mean, I and you know me well enough to know that. I don't really go into this trying to trying to screw the other party. I'm not one of those lawyers who puts lots of gotchas in the contract, but I certainly deal with those people all the time. And um, you want a fair deal, uh, but you also need to make a living, you know. So you, I mean, I think the risk there is that you end up negotiating on their behalf because what I mean, you know, I don't want to sound like a sophist or anything, but a fair deal is a pretty, pretty move, pretty limber, moving target if that's what you're going for. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how you find that. I mean, I, I mean, if if I can wake up every morning and look myself in the mirror and feel okay about it, I mean, that's about it for me. I, I don't know, uh, I, and I get what you're saying, but I, I think a lot of it is your inherent need to be liked. Um. And not yeah. a desire to be a, 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 what do they call those guys, a, a, a leader of industry, one of those cats, you know. 
you know, it, but, but I mean, so let's let, let me give you an example. So you got a thing, you got you got this thing, and it costs you a dollar to make, and it's and it, but but uh, you can sell it in the market for a thousand dollars, and it costs you a dollar to make. Okay, do you sell it for a thousand dollars or do you sell it for two dollars? Chris. Oh uh, yeah, I mean that yeah, was a question. Okay, sure. Uh, well, it, I mean it depends on you know the altruistic nature of or, or the humanitarian nature of the product. But generally speaking, yes, a thousand dollars. That's what the market is is going for. That's what it should. Right. Uh, that's what it should do. And I, well, I think that's kind of the same thing on these deal points. Okay. You don't want to cripple the other side. I mean, part of it is the enlightened self-interest. I'm about to sneeze. Yeah, part of it's enlightened self-interest. You don't want to put your, your business partner out of business. You don't want to make it so onerous for them that they can't pay you halfway through it. You want them to succeed in part because maybe it's more business for you later or maybe because you just like to see people succeed. Um, and Lord knows, I mean, personally, I, I, by the way, I don't follow any of this advice uh, personally but in my own business, but that's, that's a different thing. But I, I do think it's important not to negotiate on their behalf. And, I, what I'm hearing is, is your is your psychologist here, uh, your psychologist lawyer buddy, um, is there's an incredible need to be liked, and you don't need to be liked. I mean, it's a nice thing in your personal. I, you know, it's funny. I always I always kind of felt creepy about people who are able to completely separate their personal morality from their business morality, but I think in 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 fact there's probably something to be said for that. Do you know what I mean? Yep. No, that's good. That's a good response. It gives me a lot to think about. Thanks. No problem. That's what I'm here for. Anybody else got a question? That was a great question, by the way, Chris, because it really nailed what I see as a as a a common issue with with developers, is, and that is that they they really want to be fair. You know, they're basically honest people, and they and they just want to be fair with everybody. And uh, it's a uh, and it's a hard thing to get around. Uh, I mean, I, I and I'll be honest. Uh, I do, you know, when I do contracts uh, in a lot of situations, and sometimes contracts are developer to developer, which is which is nice. But you know, I'm not trying to get over on anybody. I want people to understand what the deal is. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of just having a clear, simple, straightforward, uh, well modeled relationship. I think uh, on the other side of it, uh, pushing too hard can uh, create a level of uh, ad an adversarial tone or a level of, uh, of a, a sense of exploitation by the other party uh, that can have a very destructive long-term impact on the relationship. So you need to keep that in mind too. And I think that mitigates in favor of maybe, you know, maybe not asking for that thing that you that you think you could get but that you don't really don't need. Um, yeah, it's complicated. It's a it's like a game. It was funny after that negotiation that I was talking about earlier, the one with John and Brenda. Um, you know, we were doing a. Uh, by the way, if you're doing ever doing a telephone consult and you have counsel with you, always make sure that you've got an IM running on the side so you guys can have the side talk. But uh, we finished it, and uh, and Brenda said to me, uh, "I get it, Tom. I never like negotiations, but negotiations are your game, aren't they?" Yes, they are, dear. Yes, they are. Uh, we have any other questions? Otherwise, uh, I'm going to call it a day. Come on, everybody. Your mics are open. Hey, Tom. Yeah. Tom, it's Ian Bush here. Hi, uh, Ian. I've got a question for you. Hi, how are you doing? Awesome. Uh, I got a... Great. Um, insurance. Um, I'm looking currently for legal counsel, and they keep pushing me in the direction of insurance. How does insurance impact a negotiation? Insurance? Yeah, um, a lot of the insurance is about uh, breach of contract that they're talking about. Uh, I guess based on what my design brief says versus what is delivered at at the time. I've never heard of insurance uh, performance. You were talking like a performance bond. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but that's what it sounds like to me. I've never seen one used in the game industry. They happen. And they do it in, in movies all the time, but I've never seen anyone have. 
But then again, you're in Canada, aren't you? That's correct. Yes, I could tell by the abut or something. Say the alphabet, I don't know for sure. Um, yeah, I usually, uh, I mean, in commercial publishing agreements, there's usually some requirements for liability, you know, one million, two million in liability insurance. That's really common. I've never seen a performance bond applied, uh, at least in the states, uh, to a game. I've, I've, you know, for years I've sort of thought this wouldn't be a bad thing to have, but geez, I don't know. And is, is it your lawyer pushing for it or theirs? Uh, I'm kind of interviewing two lawyers, and, and it's my lawyer saying that um, uh, before I even start design on a game, I should be insuring it. Um, and I'm trying to figure out if there's any capability of leveraging that insurance when you go into a negotiation. No, I, I mean, is, is, he's not talking about workers' comp insurance or some sort of employee insurance setup, or is he saying about liability? No, yeah, it's... it's Slip it's, and it's, fall in case somebody falls in your studio or slips no. on your porch? Well, it's intellectual property based. It's what? You can insure anything. It's intellectual property based. Um, so, yeah, it, another mechanism for insurance companies to make money, I'm assuming. I, I got to tell you, you got me on this one. I mean, I don't know everything. I'll admit that sometimes I don't know shit about anything, and I got stories to prove it. But um, I have no idea. Does this person actually work with game developers? Not really. I'm. I'm pretty far remote from any um, cities with with major game studios, so um, my my part of my assumption is they're sort of playing it by ear right now. That's why I'm working. I'm interviewing two of them to see. Yeah, who I would. I would. I, you know, I I, uh, I don't know. It's, I think that there's there's some real risks in um, you know using an attorney that doesn't understand the industry. This sounds like somebody who's trying to give you good advice but doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. Ooh, damn it, F bomb. And I was no, so good. That's the way. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. It sounds it sounds a little So you got you don't deal with any intellectual property insurance at all, eh? Pardon? You don't deal with any intellectual property insurance whatsoever. Never heard of it. All right. Uh, so I mean, you should ask him. I mean, get get the background and find out what it is. Do me a favor and then uh, Skype me up or send me an email and let me know what's what the hell he's talking about. I just worry that sometimes lawyers who are, especially if they're working, if they're if they're okay. Uh, with all due respect to my profession, a lot of lawyers are more more concerned with uh, getting a client than they are with uh, providing services in the traditional sense of a professional. Um, you know, holding the client's interests above their own and that sort of thing. Um, so it's not uncommon for uh, I'll get. Let me let me do this by analogy. Okay, so I got called in as when I was doing trial work. I got, got called in as a trial counsel on this case, where uh, this company had actually had a pretty good case. They probably had a case that was worth maybe five to eight million dollars. Unfortunately, the lawyer that had was handling it for him, um, who I later learned was high on coke the whole time, um, had convinced them the case was worth $300 million. And as a result, he was just litigating the crap out of it. Um, so, it, I mean, you have to kind of take that into account. I get into a lot of negotiations with, 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 uh, with clients and uh, with, you know, with somebody on the other side, and I send them a contract, and it comes back all revised, and it's all like, I can tell a lawyer put in three hours making uh, editorial changes to to my to the tone of the agreement and didn't make any substantive changes at all because they're just making a living. Um, this sounds like the kind of thing that that somebody who's who's maybe this is speculation on my part. See how cautious I am. But he could just be blowing smoke up your ass, you know, and trying to convince you that you that you know this is something you hadn't thought about. Perhaps you need to be concerned about insurance on your project, you know. And he's just saying that to create a sense of insecurity in you and a sense of of superior knowledge in him. Or if uh, I, I didn't explain the term junioring, did I? Junioring is when when the people on the other side of the, of the thing say, "Well, that's just the way it's done in the industry," you know. Obviously. I have more experience than you do, so I know what's going on and you don't, so you should do what I think or what I say. That's called juniorring someone. I learned that from one of my clients years ago. I love the term. Uh, 
but he could have been a, an effort on, on his part where he's dealing in an area, a, a technical area where he may not have the expertise of juniorring you by bringing up issues that you maybe should consider. So I would, you know, st stick him with it and say, what type of insurance should I should I do? What, what type of insurance are you referring to? And and do you do you know somewhere where I can acquire this type of insurance and see what he, see how he responds to that? And if he does one so, of those, so John, I mean, huh? So so John, I'm sort of in details until you get an answer that that makes sense to to one side. Or at least you realize that he was probably bullshitting. You know. I mean, I you know, and I, the thing is, industry is funny, I, and I I urge anybody who's, if it's an industry related deal, you should get an industry lawyer to do it. And there's a bunch of us. There's not a bunch of us, okay? But there's probably a couple dozen. And uh, but you know, some things are unique to where you are. You know, setting up your company, get a local lawyer for that. You know, tax questions, get a local get a local lawyer account for that. There's no reason for that. Uh, the lease on your on your offices, I don't want to hear about it. You know, negotiating a deal, a distribution deal with a publisher where there's funding, you should get somebody who knows what they're doing. Because I, I I have been engaged too many times to unfuck what some other lawyer did. Um, and there's a lot. It's it's not a matter of you know any good lawyer, any good transactional lawyer can look at a contract and see what's wrong with it. Because that's the way I was when I started. You know, I I'd been a, I was a trial lawyer. I did civil litigation. I did a lot of business litigation. I knew how to tear contracts apart, so I could see where the holes were. But what I couldn't do at that time, and what I think I'm able to do very well now, is know see what's missing and what should be in there. Um, you know, procedure for change orders that allows you to, that sets up sets up a preconceived acknowledgement that there's going to be changes in this deal as it goes forward. Um, you know, audit rights, how that works, which way the money goes, and how it goes, um, all that sort of things. Uh, making sure that the you know, I, I've seen uh, traditional publishing deals where uh, the publisher was advancing the budget for the game, but over 35 percent of the money was coming after the after the delivery of the gold master. And what the, and, and so what they do is they go to a developer and say, how much is it going to cost you? to make this game. And the developer being like Chris said, thinks how much how much is going to cost him to make the game doesn't add on any sort of prop, you know, no pad, no profit margin, just his actual cost. And then tells the person that and they say fine, we'll budget you at that amount. And then when you look at the at the at the deliverables and the fact that payments are made 45 days after the approval of the deliverable, and the deliverable is delivered on a certain date, but of course there's always slippage, um, and then they pay late because it's delivered in 45 days, and then there's you have to wait 30 days before you can declare a breach. So I mean, there's a whole period of time here. It could be months, and it is months under under some of these agreements where where the where the developer is not getting paid, and then if you if you track these payments out, and I've had clients do this with a spreadsheet to present back to the publisher and say, hey, this isn't going to work. And it was, it was a Microsoft deal, and we pushed them to the point where we had 10% of, of the revenue being delivered after the GM, after this, the, the delivery of the certification package, um, which was really nice because otherwise, at the very best, you're getting your profit after you're already done. Which means if they cancel any time during the process, and they can always cancel any time during the process, you're upside down. Or as this one show, as the one spreadsheet showed, there were three months in the middle of this development cycle based on their original proposal, where my client was operating their studio at a loss. So what's going on here? Um, and I've seen I've seen uh, on funded deals, I've seen publishers pushing for direct access to your to your books and records. Uh, you know, to an agreement that you won't use the money they're giving you for anything else, but the the actual development of the game, which is crazy. I guess you can't pay rent with it. Um, I, you know, uh, talk about asking for things that you shouldn't. Uh, I do go on though. I hope I hope that helps you. And you know, my Skype's on the on the screen there. You want to ping me sometimes? All right. Uh, anybody else got something? I was looking at the little list of people there. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. I hope I hope this was of some value to you, and I hope we got a decent recording without uh, uh, me 
messing up a really what turned out to be a pretty crazy uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation last time. Uh, anyway, thanks for coming and be sure to check the webinar page and the weekly uh, newsletter thingy to see what we've got up our sleeves next. Does anybody know what the next webinar is going to be on our Wednesday webinar series every Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific time? What's up next week, guys? Is it you, Chris? Yeah, you know, I believe I am up next week. It's a game design webinar and it is going to be how to plan and design procedural game levels. So if you've got any game designers in your in your teams, that's uh, or or uh, uh, I think it, it'll be interesting to engineers also. Awesome, awesome. So Great. that's what we've got coming up next week, Wednesday. And uh, one final pitch for the uh, upcoming IGDA Leadership Summit. We're bringing back our leadership event. Uh, we had the leadership forum uh, for five consecutive years in San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, we did a summit at Casual Connect for a couple years. But this year we're bringing back our own event. It's September 2nd and 3rd at the uh, Bell Harbor International Conference Center in Seattle, Washington, right on the bay. And it's, uh, that is the week between, it's in the center of the week between PAX and Labor Day weekend. So come on out for PAX, stay for the, for the Leadership Summit, and then bring your family out and go explore the Pacific Northwest for the Labor Day weekend. Uh, anyway, keep it, put it on your calendar and think about it. Uh, we'll get more information coming out soon, but it looks to be a really whiz-bang event. Thanks a lot for showing, and I'll see you all next time.